Hey, Magic Lantern listeners, there is no opening scene today, as this is a special episode. This is our rundown of our 31 days of horror viewing for the month of October to celebrate Halloween. It is the Magic Jack-O-Lantern of 2021. Do you have your chains ready to rattle? I do. Well, I've got my spooky ghost shirt on. I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolain, and welcome to episode 170, this year's review of our 31 Days of Horror viewing slate, otherwise known as the Magic Jack-O-Lantern of 2021. This is the capstone to all of our Halloween activities every year, and for our theme this time, we are looking at horror set in New England. Now this obviously opens up a lot of possibilities from Salem witchery to Stephen King stories. What makes New England a great backdrop for horror for you? The leaves changing, the history, all of that mist rolling in. I think we are totally on the same page here. It is the most naturally autumnal of settings. So it's perfect for this time of year. It conjures up for me Haunted hayrides, pumpkin patches, cider, leaves falling like you mentioned, that crispness that's in the air, and then, not to ignore the other part of that, the history also. The region is fraught with horrifying elements. Murder, religious persecution, frankly New England is a nightmare. In a great way. Before we jump right into it though, did you have any specific criteria other than locale for the films that you chose for your part of the list? I wanted to pick some of our shared old favorites, things that we never tire from coming back to, also with some brand new first-time watches, at least for me. I had a great time. I don't know about you. I did, overall. But the first one on the list, let's just go ahead and start. Let's talk about it. What is your first choice for us here? Ay, ay, ay. Okay, so we're kicking it off with Cujo. I'm so mad at you for starting us off this way. I was so mad at myself, too. I could barely watch this. It is from 1983, directed by Louis Teague, with Dee Wallace, Danny Pintaro, Daniel Hugh Kelly, and Christopher Stone. It's about an incredibly lovable St. Bernard who is in the wrong place at the wrong time, becomes rabid, and a mother and her young son are caught in the crossfire. I don't know if it's the same for you, but I cannot take dogs in peril. It's ten times worse than humans for me. The same here. This is just overwhelming sadness when I watch it. I read the book first, and the book is even more sad. Yeah, because the book actually speaks from Cujo's point of view a few times, and he's just terribly confused about what is happening to him and why things are so stressful and how come he's not a good boy anymore. It's the worst. Yeah, he never did a damn thing to anybody. It's all about the rabies. And then you've also got that trademark king thread of infidelity and alcoholic and violent fathers. Yeah, real subtle that her adultery outfit is blood red in this one. And it also is incredibly terrifying, I think. What's incredibly terrifying to me is just how the humans are all trash in this. To put this in perspective, the best of them is an advertising executive, if that helps outline where we are here. Yeah. Practically everything Cujo does in this is justifiable homicide. The only other thing that I really take away from it is that I like to think about, the thing that makes me happy to think about, is Dee Wallace Stone's legacy in the genre. Because you've got her in The Stepford Wives, which we'll have later on down the list, The Hills Have Eyes, The Howling, Critters, Popcorn... She's still at it with Lords of Salem. The Frighteners I like. She's big on the convention circuit, which I always like to see those performers embracing that aspect of their career. But overall, yeah, as far as the movie itself, it leaves me terribly sad. And I think you can feel their lives trickling away too, which is really scary. But let's put that one to bed. How about you? Now we are talking. We are getting to one of my favorites for the second choice. And that is Salem's Lot from 1979. That's directed by Toby Hooper, and it stars David Soule, Bonnie Bedelia, James Mason, 
It's got Marie Windsor and Elijah Cook Jr. in it. And it's a television miniseries adaptation of Stephen King's second published novel. And it's about a writer who returns to his old hometown only to discover that it is now home to a vampire scourge. Now, I've watched this a couple of times with you, and it never disappoints. The pacing is great. James Mason, to me, is perfect. I'm so glad he was cast in this because he's terrifying and magnetic no matter his age. Plus, it's got your girlfriend in it. Which doesn't necessarily help the next one on the list, but we'll get to that too. Yeah, this one is just oodles of atmosphere, I think is the greatest thing about this. With the head vampire, you've got a nice throwback to the makeup of Nosferatu. The cast is uniformly great in this top to bottom. And there are so many neat little details that impart that spookiness. One of them that I was happening to pay more attention to this time than previous times, it felt like. The crane shot when the child flies into his brother's bedroom window. The way they were able to achieve that, wire-free, so he could actually break that plane of moving from outside to inside. If you go to the the behind-the-scenes part of this, it's really fun to see how they did that. And it's such an eerie effect. I think it's a Stephen King adaptation done so well. It fits in all of those other side stories and details that you expect from the book. Well, how about you introduce the next one and we'll finish off our introductory Stephen King trifecta here. So I picked Needful Things because I remembered this pretty fondly the once and only time I saw it on video soon after it came out. And that was from 1993, directed by Fraser C. Heston with Max von Sydow, Bonnie Bedelia, Ed Harris, and Amanda Plummer about a mysterious new curio shop opening in town that seems to stock only your heart's desire, but at an incredible cost. Yeah, this one was a disappointment to me, unfortunately, especially butted up against Salem's lot because with this conceit of the new shop opening up, it seems like these are just slight divergences on the same timeline, practically. Yeah, I don't think it holds up quite as well these days. We've seen the incredible work that the entire cast can do. I will say, though, it does seem like Max von Sydow is having a hell of a time. Yeah, that is a blast. That part of it is very fun to watch. He is savoring being this evil. And I like the setting. I like the premise. I like everyone in it. I think I ultimately just wanted it to either go black as pitch or full camp. Yeah, in this one, I actually think I prefer Amanda Plummer to my dearly beloved Bonnie Bedelia. Yeah, she's wonderful. And film number two out of three, that a dog gets it. So thanks again for that. Well, I didn't make the movie. (laughs) So our next choice was The Invisible Man, which we covered over in episode 168. So go take a listen to that. And then we moved on to The Mummy's Tomb from 1942, directed by Harold Young with Lon Chaney Jr., George Zuko, my favorite, Dick Foran, Elise Knox, and John Hubbard. The Egyptian mummy Karis has been sent to America to wreak vengeance on the family of the man who opened the sacred tomb of his beloved. Yeah, genre favorites here. Huge for us. Lon Chaney Jr., George Zuko, lantern favorite. This definitely does have a better-looking mummy than the follow-up, The Mummy's Ghost, which we'll talk about here in a second. And they are not shy about recycling footage for this. This has footage from the mummy's hand. It has some villagers with torches from Frankenstein. There's so much flashback in this, they should call it the mummy's other hand, basically. So a couple of questions for you. Why did they take a magician with them on the expedition in the first place? That seems like a bad choice. That depends on the magician. I don't want to hang out with Chris Angel, but if you bring Ricky Jay on this expedition, I'm all for that. Okay, fine. I never want Wallace Ford on any expedition because you know I can't stand that guy. And I don't know about you, but it was really kind of hard to tell what time had elapsed due to the makeup and the framing story. But anyway, it ends with a big fire and a shootout and there are discussions about forcible childbearing and rape and then everything's fine. The one thing I take away from this is that Egypt has atmosphere, and New England really doesn't. And the only other thing it made me think of, I actually saw these two movies, The Mummy's Tomb and The Mummy's Ghost, 
before I saw the original with Karloff as a kid, so more than anything as a very young person, these shaped my idea of what the mummy was the most. Work that then had to be undone, thankfully. Which leads us to The Mummy's Ghost from 1944. This entry was directed by Reginald Laborg, and again it stars Lon Chaney Jr. George Zuko is back, and this also has John Carradine and Ramsey Ames. And it is the third in a series of unofficial sequels to The Mummy, and one of two in the series to come out just that year. This came out in June, and then the follow-up came out in December. And again, it's about a 3,000-year-old mummy menacing a Massachusetts town while he looks for his reincarnated princess. I still say a mummy movie is a fun way to go, regardless of what mummy movie it is. And this mummy features visible panty line, by the way. This one is pretty goofy, not terribly well acted or well scripted. The coroner is even addressed as coroner. And there's a headline that reads, Mummy Believed to be Back in New England. Greatest headline ever. Do you feel like The Mummy is the most diminished returns of all the Universal Monster original franchises when it comes to these sequels? I think so, because you know I love the Frankenstein offshoots yeah. and the Wolfman offshoots. And Dracula could only be improved because of how stagey and dry that it was a lot of the time. Yeah, I consider The Mummy to be my favorite of the Universal Monsters, so this is quite a big drop-off from 1932 to once you get to these mid-40s entries. And I just want to say in defense of one of my picks here, dogs are where it's at, because dogs hate this mummy. So our next choice, I guess we ended up diverging a little bit, which I have to say I'm kind of surprised, so I'm interested to see what your commentary is on this one. I picked The Lodge from 2019, directed by Severin Fiala and Veronica Franz, with Riley Keogh, Jaden Martell, and Leah McHugh, about a soon-to-be stepmom who gets stranded in the family cabin with her soon-to-be stepchildren who do not want her around. I have to say, I was very excited when I saw the new Hammer Films logo come up. It's always a surprise because I don't think of them being as major a player, obviously, as they used to be in the genre. But it is nice and reassuring to see, once in a while, to be reminded that, yes, they are still in the game. And I don't know that we diverged that much on this one, because I did enjoy it, maybe just not quite as much as you. I still gave it three and a half stars out of five. Well, let me explain why I liked it so much, okay. and then let me know what you think. So, I like this because everyone is great in it, starting from the devastating beginning with Alicia Silverstone. There is a moment there where she commits suicide, and this is not a spoiler because it happens right away, that there's a bit of character work that she's doing that I don't know if you can pick up on. It's almost imperceptible. But you can just feel in her movements, in her thought process, the split second between when she puts her finger on that trigger and then shoots herself in the mouth, I feel for all the world the urgency in that because she knows if she doesn't do this quickly, she's not going to have the courage to follow through on it. I feel that in that scene so much. And then I think the film becomes all about consequences. It's consequences for every belief, every faith, every action of those who came before you, and then from the choices that you make as well. And I love the setting. I think you can feel the house get progressively colder. There are fun details, like Riley Keogh's dad is the one who does the dad cult leader's voice. And I like that it's less about the twist, because you can guess that part. It's much more about the aftermath, consequences again. Well, I'm right there with her in certain respects. All this religious iconography in the house, it would make me nervous, too. It's totally moody. You're absolutely right about feeling the cold. She's great in it. She's great in everything. I'd watch her do anything. And I think the biggest struggle of it, for me, the most fun thing to struggle with, is what an impossible position this character has been put in. Now, I don't know if I feel as pleasantly about the characters themselves. The performers, absolutely. But no one is good here. These children, they have a little bit of psychopathy going on, practically. This feels a little bit like The Shining if I was just pulling for everyone to be killed. The one part of it that knocks the score down a little bit for me is that it feels like a later entry trying to capitalize on this more contemporary wave of artsy horror, of A24 style horror. And like in all these cases where one thing is successful and then there are bandwagon hoppers, it just does not quite live up to 
The Witch, Midsummer, Hereditary, but I still do see the appeal of the film, and I think they achieve a great deal of what they set out to do. Next for me, we have The Dunwich Horror, and this is from 1970, and that's directed by Daniel Haller, starring Dean Stockwell, Sandra D, and Ed Begley. And it's a loose adaptation of the H.P. Lovecraft story in which a young grad student is targeted by a man attempting to use her in an ancient occult ritual that he has found in the Necronomicon. This was a first watch for me, and I'm so glad we put this one on the list. I really enjoyed it. And it's American International, so you know it's going to be great. It has me from the great opening credit sequence. It's basically satanic Saul Bass. But then there are those other things that horror fans feel comfortable and at home with. We've got the ivy-covered halls of Miskatonic University, all of this atmosphere and psychedelics that are appropriate to the era, especially as being exploited by American International Pictures. And then my favorite little subversive part of the whole thing, I think, Sandra D. somewhat shedding her virginal image as the projected target of this sacrifice. Well, they are pretty casual at that library, I have to say. You can handle all sorts of artifacts, no ID needed. It, the film's just got a solid structure and execution. I think it's really great. I love the representation of the old gods. I love the, when the gates open, the old ones shall walk. So how about our next choice? We're going back in time to The House of the Seven Gables from 1940, directed by Joe May with George Sanders, Vincent Price, Dick Foran again, Cecil Kellaway, my favorite, and Margaret Lindsay. So in the titular house, an ancient curse haunts two feuding brothers. This was also a first watch for me. Very, very fun. I love to see Vincent Price in both Hawthorne and Poe, which I watched as well, separated by decades. The actress Nan Gray here, I swear, looks like Michelle Pfeiffer. Cecil Kellaway is so incredibly fun, as he is in everything, and the production itself just looks impeccable. It had a very low budget, but kind of like with Halloween Kills, the production designer went to Salem, Massachusetts, went to the house that was the inspiration for the story, and took all kinds of photographs and measurements to try to recreate it. And I have another fun fact for you. Okay. I don't know if you knew this. So in 1935, The Raven came out, and apparently there was this big outcry because it was so gruesome. So then, Universal Studios decided to place a ban on the production of horror films. But in 1938, there was a movie theater in New York City who did a triple bill of Dracula, Frankenstein, and Son of Kong. It was so popular, they ran it 21 hours a day. Universal decided, nope, let's get back in the horror business. How, if you're universal in the world, can you turn your back on what had to be your bread and butter from that time period? Well, this to me is more of a George Sanders vehicle than a Vincent Price vehicle. But it has so many of those fun period things. The old witchcraft swindle, a curse from the gallows. You've got Vincent Price as a crooner in this. It's just a true gothic treat. And there's one particular line that I think will always stick with me from this. Sometimes these things pop up in the most unexpected places, but what a pity men must inherit their ancestors' ignorance instead of their wisdom. I like the love story in it, too. It's almost kind of Count of Monte Cristo. Well, moving on to the second of what's kind of a pairing here, we did Dragonwick from 1946 next. And that's directed by Joseph L. Mankiewicz and stars Gene Tierney, Walter Houston, and Vincent Price again. And it's about a Connecticut farm girl who is recruited by a distant relative to be a governess to his daughter. And the way these things usually do, things gradually reveal themselves to be much more troubling than she first understood. Now, would you say that this pairing is the set of least traditional picks for a horror lineup? Do they get by because they're gothic tales? I think you're right on the money with that. And there's some melodrama in there too, which is really fun. I think though, Spring Byington makes a great Mrs. Danvers in this story. Well, it's definitely a classic case of a house with dark secrets. And I think they're fairly subversive secrets for the time. Vincent Price's drug addiction obviously is a big thing. And especially the ease with which he got away with murdering his first wife. 
Well, are you ready for the frothiest confection on this list? Let's do it. I picked I Married a Witch from 1942, which was also a first watch for me. Directed by Renee Clare, with Veronica Lake, Frederick March, Cecil Kellaway again, and Robert Benchley. About a 17th century witch who returns to life to plague the descendant of her Puritan persecutor. Boy, this was fun. Veronica Lake is so funny. She's so impish in a perfect way. I love that the witches start out with extremely malevolent intent. It shall be fun to plague humanity again. Yeah, this makes Sinister fun. It's so breezy and witty. I like the folklore of the oak tree. That's really nice touch. But she's just obviously far and away the best part of this. She's so irrepressible. It's so easy to see how you would fall in love with this person. Sliding down banisters, eating fistfuls of waffles. But you're right, they don't sacrifice the malevolence. Because Cecil Kellaway, the whole time, he has this dark, vengeful undercurrent that he is dead set on. But it's a perfect blend. It's the intersection of Screwball and Renee Claire. Imagine if Preston Sturgis had actually directed this thing. The only way that I think it could be better for me is if there was more Benchley in it. I think it would make a pretty fun double feature with The Devil and Daniel Webster. Well, I think it makes a pretty fun double feature with the one that I picked next, and that is The City of the Dead from 1960. That's directed by the vastly underrated John Llewellyn Moxie, and it stars Christopher Lee, Patricia Jessel, and Venetia Stevenson. It's about a young college student who arrives in a sleepy Massachusetts town to do some research on witchcraft, and the proprietor of the local inn has some deeply witchy roots. I'm going to tell you a little story about the first time I saw this. The first time I saw this was in my teens at a friend of my mother's. For some reason, they had all gone out somewhere, and I stayed behind by myself because either I didn't feel good or I didn't want to do what they were all going to do. Either way, I was alone, up for the late, late movie, and completely freaked myself out with this one. It was one of those right time, right place discoveries. I actually sort of wrote about my sense memory for this, too, because you introduced it to me a few years back. I've watched it many times since then. And I like the way that it looks in that very singular way that the outdoors are clearly sets. It recalls this sense of watching something on TV, again, by myself, late, late show or an afternoon matinee. And that is totally great for me. I think the thing I relate to in all these witch stories that we're doing here, I don't know if it's the same for you. I was always instinctively on the side of the infidel and against the self-righteous mob. Oh, heck yeah. But I like the way that turns here too, because one of my favorite characters in the whole thing, and something that I think is a little daring for the time, you have that bitter reverend who no longer has a congregation. That's a bit of unexpected darkness for me for 1960. And then of course, what you mentioned, the aesthetics, the production design, I love it. They spared no expense on the fog machine. It's filled with inky shadows, all this stuff cast by firelight. It looks amazing. They spared all the expense on the dialect coaches because <laughs> no one here is an American and they're all playing Americans. But anyway, moving on to a pretty big title for the list, and that is The Witch from 2015, written and directed by Robert Eggers with Anya Taylor-Joy, Ralph Innocen, and Kate Dickey, who I know you're a big fan of. Big fan of both of theirs, actually. It's about a family in 1630s New England who is torn apart by the forces of black magic. Now, we loved this when we saw it in the theater and have loved it each time afterward. And at this point, Anya Taylor-Joy is pretty ubiquitous, but back then, it was basically our first glimpse of how incredibly talented she is. This is a gut punch at times, at other times it's just slow dread, as we begin to understand that she has absolutely nowhere to go as these events start to escalate and the blame turns to her. Yeah, this one still holds up. I was afraid that it might be the case where once the hype died down, I realized that maybe I'd been taken in by that a little, but that's definitely not the case. Egger's method is more than just a series of creative ticks, I feel like. The sum total of all of that is that he creates an immersive atmosphere that I feel like goes beyond the screen. It reaches out into you, if you're patient with it, and if you give yourself over to the conceit. 
The imagery in this is consistently frightening, and then what we don't see only heightens the paranoia. It's like in those other films that we talk about, including The Invisible Man, when you're looking at the shadows trying to determine, did I see something? Is there something there? And even though sometimes these things get away from me in those environments, I would say this is definitely a fun choice to see in a festival environment as well. Sometimes it's good to just let that euphoria that you feel eight days into a festival on no sleep take hold of you, and then later you can sort all that out. Well, let's move forward a couple of centuries here and talk about our number 14 selection, The Spiral Staircase from 1946. That's directed by Robert Siodmak, and it stars Dorothy McGuire, George Brent, and Ethel Barrymore. I always forget that Elsa Lanchester's in it, mm -hmm. too, and that big old bulldog. I love the bulldog. This is about a young mute woman who works in an upper-crust New England household and is being terrorized by a maniac who is killing off women with disabilities. The verisimilitude of the witch notwithstanding, I feel like this is the most successful period piece on our list. Really getting that specific time period and gothicness quite right with all of the luridness that came with it. Yeah, with some of the others, especially with that Seven Gables Dragonwick pairing, I am aware that I'm watching costume drama sometimes. But this, not at all. And I think the biggest part of that is the house and the way they shot it. That's the biggest advantage the film has. I feel lured into it ensconced within it practically with all these deep shadows and details and textures all of that environment it works perfectly to establish the close quarters feeling the proximity to terror and the inescapability of all of that yeah i love the setting i love the big storm the silence of the country but the tawdriness of the village and i also think that george brent is generally forgotten these days and i think that's pretty unfair because i like everything he's in well i know you've got one that you're just dying to talk about next i hope you like constant jazz music underscoring <laughs> that is meant for an entirely different film and that is tormented from 1960 directed by the late great Bert I. Gordon, with all that entails, and starring Richard Carlson, Lou Jean Sanders, and Julie Redding about an old, old man who accidentally lets his old girlfriend fall to her death, and then she returns to him to haunt him on the eve of his wedding to a girl who looks like she should be his daughter. Even though it's purloined from somewhere else, the budget for this all went to the score, right? For sure. Now, do you harbor a grudge against Richard Carlson for being the lamest part of The Creature from the Black Lagoon? And basically every other movie. No, I have seen him in stuff that I did like, but yeah, he's 48 here, but he's playing some sort of a beefcake. He's always wearing short shorts and tight tops. Uh, he's three years younger than me. Yeah, and you don't see you walking around in a tank top all the time. Uh, get ready. <laughs> well, here's some things I learned from this movie. Don't attempt to blackmail someone and then offer up that piece of info that no one knows I'm here. And then I guess I'm splitting hairs here maybe, but he didn't kill her as much as not not kill her. There's dialogue like, I hope I'm ready for the Carnegie Hall concert. Uh, dude, you already booked it. So unless you were just planning to show up and rush the stage, yes, you are fine. I do love a good lighthouse setting, though. That's true. The rest of the sets, though, it's clearly one quarter of a room that is constantly changed around to be multiple houses. Even with that, though, I'm thinking of somebody like Edgar G. Ulmer, because you've got Ernest Laszlo behind the camera here. And he can do good work on a budget. Look at stuff like DOA, Kiss Me Deadly, Inherit the Wind, Judgment at Nuremberg. He was the president of the American Society of Cinematographers, so no slouch. He clearly owed somebody something. Well, do you think this suffers from the association we have with it, with Mystery Science Theater 3000? No, it only gains <laughs> from that association. Well, I think I like this one more than you, obviously. I like it because it feels like maybe a creep show vignette or a Twilight Zone episode. Maybe the problem is just that it's overly long for what it is. I think you're absolutely right. And in different hands, it could have been kind of fun and creepy. Well, I'll trade you hate views for hate views because next for number 16, we have coming up The Shuttered Room. From 1967. I liked this one. I'm referring specifically to a performer. 
your hate for Richard Carlson probably matches mine for Gig Young. Oh, I love Gig Young. This is directed by David Green, starring the aforementioned Young, along with Carol Lindley, Oliver Reed, and Flora Robeson. It's about a young woman who inherits a mill in her New England hometown, who returns there with her husband, only to uncover the prerequisite dark secrets. It's ostensibly from the H.P. Lovecraft universe. You'll hear a couple of familiar names here. But that's not where the real terror comes from in this. This is much more frightening in terms of what happens to outsiders when they try to enter a closed-off, hostile society. Yeah, to me it played more like I Spit on Your Grave or Straw Dogs than the Dunwich Horror. Yeah, you've got that urban interlopers versus rural community theme that you find often in folk horror. Gig Young is awful, let me repeat that. Always, if anyone deserves the straw dogs type treatment, it's him. Carol Lindley, on the other hand, is perfect in her sun-drenched, stray hair blowing in front of her face kind of way. And the locations do a lot for this one. You've got the mill house. We have another lighthouse. What more could you ask for? Yeah, the scenery is great because it really is on location. I love the framing. I like that score of the pounding brass and percussion. And it gets played straight, which I really appreciate. It does, to me, end up feeling kind of overly long, but I like that it's all happening basically within the same long day. Okay, well, what do you have next? I picked The Curse of the Living Corpse, and speaking of MST3K, this was directed by Del Tenney, and I think he did this back-to-back with The Horror of Party Beach. It's from 1964, even though it basically looks like 1952, trying to play 1892, with Roy Scheider, Helen Warren, Robert Milley, and Margot Hartman. Oh, you're leaving out a big one. What about Candace Hillegas? I'll get there in just a second. It's about the relatives who come back for a reading of the will, but the dead, quote-unquote, comes back to life and starts killing everyone. This does look like the same locations from the Horror of Party Beach, by the way. And my big question here is about Candace Hillegas. I don't understand why she didn't do more movies, because she has this look about her that to me always seems quite modern, so I think she could have just kept going. Everyone is incredibly theatrical in this. Yeah, acting! Exclamation point. For sure. I think they really tried to aim for highbrow, but they couldn't quite achieve it for a number of reasons, mainly from the idea that they don't quite know where to put the camera or how to move it. I'm sure these speeches that they got to deliver were a huge part of the appeal to what were then young, struggling actors. Something you could really sink your teeth into. And then on the other side of things, you have fun genre conventions like the head on a platter. That reveal is nice. You've got the comic relief detective, which works, your mileage may vary. Uh, Yeah. But this thing you're saying about her looking so modern and how 1952 trying to look like 1892, what is it about the region that so lends itself to period pieces more than other places? I think it's maybe because so much of the area is unchanged. Yeah, it's basically the cradle of Anglo-American history, as it were. Well, by the way, AFI said the critical reception to the film was, quote, generally scathing. I think that may be being a little bit harsh. I still had fun with this one, even though it is very scenery chewy and some of the reveals are a little creaky. It's more in line with kind of an Edgar Wallace mystery. But if you know that that's what you're getting going in, it's perfectly fine entertainment. Well, day number 18 in our rotation, that fell to Let Sleeping Corpses Lie, which we devoted an entire episode to in episode 169. So go back and listen to that one and we'll discuss that one at length. So how about we get a little Roger Corman up in here? Oh, yeah. I picked House of Usher from 1960, directed by Roger Corman with Vincent Price and Mark Damon, all about a fiancé and a family curse. Now, this was not a story that I read when I was a kid, strangely enough. So I never remember going into it what the central mystery is, if it's incest or some sort of a genetic beast or whatever. So it's always great fun. I love the menu of this on the Arrow release, if you can get that specific release of the film. Now, Mark Damon is not Robert Goulet, but an incredible simulation. I love the house. I also wonder, could they just 
leave the house, maybe, and get through all of this? But Vincent Price does answer that. He thinks if his sister goes out of it, that these new malignant cancers will spread outward. Savage degradations, first in England, then in New England, and there's a dream ballet. Yeah, this is second only to The Mask of the Red Death for me in terms of Corman's Poe adaptations. It takes Corman's usual liberties with his source material, definitely, but every dollar is on screen and then some. The net result of that is basically that it's overstuffed in the best way for material like this. It's overripe, it's lush. And I think it's an interesting case study in how perceptions change over time. How one thing stays in its spot and how we move all around it. Coming back to it, moving away from it. I would be really curious to know if the 1960 audience found it a bit silly because of a stylistic disconnect that turns out to be a little timeless. Well, you picked another great one for the next choice. Yeah, let's keep this ball rolling with The Haunted Palace from 1963. Also directed by Roger Corman as one of the eight films in his Edgar Allan Poe cycle, even though it's based on an H.P. Lovecraft story. It stars Vincent Price, Lon Chaney Jr., and Deborah Paget, and is about a New England village held in the grip of a dead necromancer. Its main source is actually the case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft, with eight lines only from Poe's titular poem used as the most tenuous framing device. A classic AIP move to change the name of the film to capitalize on the momentum of Corman's Poe cycle. I love the elaborate credit sequences, uh, this time with the spider web for those AIP pictures. And yeah, you've got the reliable crew here. And Roger Corman can make 10 bucks look like a million bucks. I love the sets on this. And it's kind of a Lovecraftian milestone, too. This is the first major film to mention the Necronomicon. The thing that gets most right for me when we're talking about Lovecraftian themes is that feeling that humans are ridiculous and inconsequential in the face of a larger, more impersonal universe. We are a minor consideration at best to the old gods. I love how gleefully dark this movie is, and the villain takes too much time for revenge and attempted rape, so learn your lessons, people. The next choice I would say for both of us all time top of the list. Yeah, definitely. And that is The Haunting from 1963, directed by Robert Wise, with Julie Harris, Claire Bloom, Richard Johnson, and Rust Hamblin, about the very evil Hill House and the forces at work trying to keep one member of the party from ever leaving. I mean, this is perfect sets, perfect intro and narration, perfect tone, perfect acting, perfect characters in all of their flaws. By the way, unrelated to this, I listened to the audiobook narrated by David Warner last year, and it is wonderful. It completely captures the mood. Well, this is one of the single greatest ghost stories ever committed to film. Julie Harris and her mix of fragility and determination could never be improved upon. No one should try to play that character again. And I could sit and watch those shots of that wallpaper in the dark and every time, my mind will conjure up a new set of horrors. The sound design on this definitely doesn't get as much appreciation as it should either. That's one of the most terrifying elements of the whole thing. And I love that our opinion about this is basically borne out every time we show it to someone. We've done this for movie nights before. It's always a huge hit, even among people who don't like old movies, quote unquote. This one is just sort of transcendent. For me, the next one is kind of like that too. Maybe not to such a great degree, but I really enjoy this next choice. Coming in at the number 22 spot, we have The Other from 1972, and that's directed by Robert Mulligan and adapted by Thomas Tryon from his novel of the same name. He also did Harvest Home. One of the great folk horror films ever. This one stars Martin and Chris Udvernoki, Uta Hagen, Diana Moldauer, and Victor French. John Ritter gets third billing in it. And it's about a series of gruesome accidents, quote unquote, that plague a small New England farming community that come to revolve around two identical twin brothers and their family. This has such a deceptive menace to it, I feel like. Mulligan often makes these sun-dappled nostalgic reveries. Because it has a very tactile sense of summer, so it's a little bit of an outlier in these choices. Yeah. 
He applied that skill here in a way that reveals the darkness underneath that summer sun. You feel that longing for time and place for a simpler time, but you soon come to realize these are the bad old days on this particular farmstead. This is a great addition to the canon of bad seeds. Yeah, because he is dead and he seemed like a real asshole when he was alive. It's good and creepy. Crazily, this was Uta Hagen's film debut. It's so hard for me to wrap my mind around that. There's pitchfork foo in this. Murder in the Blue Room is referenced, which is really fun. That should give you a sense that something else is happening. So speaking of dark secrets, I picked The Stepford Wives from 1975, directed by Brian Forbes with Catherine Ross, Tina Louise, and Paula Prentice about the women of a very exclusive community who seem to look and act like the perfect wives. It turns out the husbands are experimenting with creating a super race of perfect wives that will do their bidding, look beautiful, and never talk back. Why, you ask? Because we can, they say. So, did I tell you that I was kind of on an Ira Levin kick when I was younger? Mm, no. I was working in the library. I discovered all of these books from the movies that I knew, so I read most of them. But for this one, I hadn't actually gotten around to seeing the movie version until this year for the episode. I liked this so much. Starting from that very first shot of Catherine Ross, it's so expressive. And by the way, just this year in Dear Prudence or one of those similar advice columns, there was a question from a woman whose husband complained when she took Sundays off from doing her hair and makeup. So these issues are still happening. Everybody in this is great. Tina Louise is especially great. It's wonderful to see her here. I like that consciousness raising group that feels very much of the time. And by the way, Mary Stuart Masterson is one of the kids. We've got some pretty good components here. Catherine Ross, all-time crush for me. William Goldman, screenplay. Of course we should be suspicious of the suburbs. Of course we should be wary of bland conformity. This goes all the way back to our Groundhog Day episode for me and Andy McDowell saying, oh, just the things everyone wants, the white picket fence, etc. Get away from those people. They are pod people. My favorite thing about the film, actually, is the way they use Catherine Ross's most human trait against her. Her maternal instinct to protect her children is what lures her into their trap. The irony of them using her humanity to then access and erase her humanity is just so dark and sad. I especially love Paula Prentice in this. I'm always a fan of hers, but using her sexuality against her as well. And the Equal Rights Amendment still not ratified. Uh, who you telling? And as long as we're talking about ripped from the headlines, let's talk about The Children from 1980. This is directed by Max Kamanowitz, and it stars Martin Shakar, Gil Rogers, and Gail Garnett. It's got a score by Harry Manfredini, who would become better known for the other score he generated in 1980 for Friday the 13th. And this is about a group of children in a small New England town that are turned into bloodless, black-fingernailed zombies by a yellow toxic cloud that then go around basically microwaving everything they touch. Now, we often talk about how cultural anxieties creep into horror films at the time, and sometimes it's more overt exploitation. Just a few months prior to the release of this, we had the Three Mile Island nuclear accident. So with that and things like Love Canal, this was definitely on people's minds. But I think the best part of it for me, the thing I like the most, I like how unattractive it is. It's not egregious or over the top necessarily, but it doesn't shy away from the taboo of killing children. It's basically audacious enough to not care what you think or to go out of its way to make these ideas palatable. Yeah, I think it's great fun and very, very weird because I think it is so regional. It has that huge regional feel to it, just like Friday the 13th did. And that has some terrible acting and some very good acting mixed in together. It just keeps getting better, I think, on the list. Another of our shared favorites. I picked Dead and Buried from 1981, directed by Gary Sherman, with James Ferentino, Melody Anderson, Jack Albertson, and your favorite, Lisa Blount. Oh, yeah. It is about a small town killing tourists, 
but the dead don't seem to stay dead. You should always be suspicious if Lisa Blount cozies up to you on a beach. You should be looking over your shoulder, because a mob may be looking to beat you to death and set you on fire. This has got some early-ish Stan Winston effects, and they're really good. Yeah. It's full of creepy, gory details. That severed arm in the grill of the car, that's such a great touch. Even more than that, though, I love this pervasive sense of dread, the conspiracy vibe of the whole thing. What do you do when you're one man against the world, or at least your world, as far as you know it? Yeah, definitely. There are so many great character actors here giving this feel almost of kind of timelessness to me. Strangely enough, though, Jack Albertson, I still haven't seen very much of his work in total. Well, they definitely do bring more gravity to it. It's more than just an empty genre exercises, and I think it's reflected in the writing. It's just smart enough to act as its own filter, basically. It strikes just the right balance of plot machinery with shocks and scares so that you're going to get rid of the riffraff and the people that want to see something genuinely interesting are going to stick around. I like that you should never trust your elders, essentially. My children, my art, my masterpiece, he says. Okay, we're kind of getting into the home stretch here. We are at entry number 26 now, and that is The Dead Zone from 1983. That's directed by David Cronenberg, and it stars Christopher Walken, Brooke Adams, Tom Skerritt, Herbert Lom, and Martin Sheen. And we're going back to the Stephen King well one last time on this list for one of my favorite of his adaptations. It's about a school teacher who awakens from a coma to find that he has the dubious gift, quote unquote, of psychic powers. Now, when you look at this lineup top to bottom, is this the best pedigree of everything on the list? I think it has to be. I especially love Martin Sheen descending into madness. Brooke Adams is always great. Christopher Walken is at his sheepish, gentle mode, which works so well. And I think I like most of all, and I think what Stephen King excels at, it has a very specific setting. The world building happens here and you believe it. Yeah, I look at the contributors to this and then what came out of it. It makes me realize just how marginalized horror films used to be. Because even with this lineup of talent, it was relegated to what was essentially the genre ghetto back then. But it still gets to me, and it does what some of my all-time favorite horror movies do so well. You mentioned this earlier. It makes me feel cold. And not just temperature cold, but cold and empty. That's not a gift that I get enough. The bar has been raised so high for me with horror films that I may suffer from some desensitization. But when I encounter one like this, one that makes me feel hollow and somewhat despairing for the human race, that's when I know you've got some. For 27, I picked another first watch for me that I ended up liking way more than I thought I was going to, and that is The Devonsville Terror from 1983, directed by Enfant Terrible, <laughs> Uli Lomel, with Susanna Love, Donald Pleasance for some reason, Robert Walker Jr., and Paul Wilson, who I think ended up being kind of my favorite. And it is strangely about toxic masculinity and rape culture in a cursed New England town. I like how Lomel likes to try to have his cake and eat it too with the certain exploitation elements of this that maybe undercut the message just a little bit. Could be. There are a lot of things going for it though. Hey, by the way, did you know Robert Walker Jr. only died in 2019? I had no idea. Crazy. I like the beginning. It's so eerie. I looked more into Susanna Love's background, which is very interesting. She's kind of his secret weapon, I feel like. Totally agreed. Even though she's got the 80s perm and bangs. It's just incredibly creepy and an effective human-based horror story. Uli Lomel, sometimes rightfully, sometimes not, I think gets the short shrift. And in cases like this, where he is hitting mostly on all cylinders, I think it's a shame that he is written off the way he is. You see little touches. The hungry pigs in this at the beginning, that is a grisly addition to a witch trial. Okay, he does all of this to himself. I'm not going to suggest that, you know, he's unfairly lumped into the bad category sometimes. That's true, but there are some real high points when you look at his work with Fassbender. You look at The Tenderness of Wolves, a film I love. For sure. Totally agree with you. But you mentioned I Spit on Your Grave earlier. I think that's the territory that we're inching up to with this one. You come to realize 
creeps haven't evolved all that much in the last 400 years. And it's also, I think, visiting this theme the first time that we'll come to in one of our other choices near the end here, of these characters that have this latent or dormant witchcraft that they are unaware of, but that manifests itself at just the right time. For the 28th, for what would have been my birthday, we've got a heavy hitter here. We are going with Reanimator from 1985. That's directed by Stuart Gordon and stars Jeffrey Combs, Barbara Crampton, Bruce Abbott, and David Gale. And it, too, is based on an H.P. Lovecraft story and is about a medical student who has created a reagent that can reanimate dead bodies. This is iconic and just wonderfully over the top. Sometimes you just have to lean into the absurdity with an absolutely straight face, and no one is better at that than Jeffrey Combs. It has such a great sense of humor. For some reason, I always mix this up with Repo Man, and so I had sort of <laughs> avoided it, but I'm so glad that we watched it. You shouldn't avoid Repo Man either. Um, yeah, maybe. Harry Dean Stanton. I know, but it just seems gross and grimy in a way I'm not sure I can take. Uh, I don't think it's going to turn out the way you think. Okay. We'll talk about that next year. Okay. This one is pretty gross, which feels completely on point. I do wish, though, the story had all been about Herbert West because Jeffrey Combs is the best. That guy can sweat. I want to just give a shout out to Barbara Crampton, too, because she's another like D. Wallace Stone, beloved fixture in the horror community. And I so appreciate her for embracing what the genre has done for her. I'm never a big fan of those performers who resent what brought them to prominence or somehow imply that they're above it. She never has done that. She always has such a good time with it and is so giving to fans. It's fun to watch her interact on Twitter with people. Conventions, the same thing. And then Stuart Gordon, the real strong suit of his films, he knows the difference between letting humor happen and constantly cracking jokes. So this is horror comedy that I can definitely appreciate. Well, how the mighty have fallen. Uh, you say that, but I like this one. Oh my god. This is Warlock from 1989, directed by Steve Miner. Big pedigree there with Julian Sands, you know I love him, Laurie Singer, Richard E. Grant, and Mary Warrenoff about a time-traveling 17th century warlock and the witch hunter on his trail in 1989 L.A. So I had heard forever that this was terrible, and I think it only has one star, basically, so we decided to give it a chance. There are some fun details in there. I don't know about you, but the beginning of the film, this looked like Babette's Feast to me, which is pretty cool. My favorite line, I have to say, believe it upon seeing it. You gotta be there, I guess. Otherwise, it is fairly crappy until Laurie Singer gets punched in the face by Richard E. Grant. She gets knocked around by the warlock, too. I wondered at one point, how is there still an hour to go of this film? And I've got one fun fact. Did you know Laurie Singer and Mark Singer are siblings? Yeah. How did I miss that? Well, this movie is just kind of underratedly bonkers, I think, and still a little old-fashioned at the same time. Richard Grant, he's always just teetering on the edge of camp, and I think that plays just right here. And then Julian Sands always seems like he's having a pretty good time. I like to think that his actor secret is always just, I can't believe I'm getting away with doing this for a living. I think you're probably right. That goes back to vibes, too. Yeah. This is just a fun lark if you go into it expecting more dark comedy than actual horror. Good point. Reframe your expectations. Yeah. So there are some fun, gory touches, too. And then there are a lot of fun details in terms of what it adds to the witch-slash-warlock lore. That bit about driving nails into his footprints, I think that's a great example. We'll talk about pedigree. We've got another big one here. Number 30, The Witches of Eastwick from 1987. That's directed by George Miller of Mad Max and Babe Pig in the City fame. And it stars Michelle Pfeiffer, Cher, Susan Sarandon, and Jack Nicholson. It's based on John Updike's novel of the same name and is about three unfulfilled women who are initially unaware of their own witchiness that encounter a dark stranger with diabolical intentions of his own. Just right off the bat, I have to say a secret weapon here, Veronica Cartwright. She makes such a great hysteric in everything. I don't know how she developed her special, unique talent for gut-wrenching, retching, and crying, but she is the master of that. And also, Richard Jenkins always looked like he was 45. I think he will until the end of time. 
Now, I don't know if it was the same for you, but I had not seen this one since it came out. But I remember what a big deal it was at the time. Definitely one of those talk about it around the water cooler or sisters are doing it for themselves cultural moments. I didn't think of it as subtle exactly, but it's bigger and more boisterous than I remember. This is all about personalities and the way they interact rather than performances. I've seen it since then. I do remember it being a very big deal when I was a kid. I thought it was so adult, these concepts. And I remember basically every single beat in this film. I think it's just a ton of fun. There's lots of spewage, which is pretty <laughs> gross, but also quite fun. This is a big highlight for me. Well, what do you have in the anchor position? Let's talk about truly terrible people, shall we? I picked Cabin Fever from 2002, directed by Eli Roth, with Jordan Ladd, Ryder Strong, James DeBello, and Serena Vincent. This certainly does the job in the sense that I want to see all of these kids die. Absolutely. These are college students on vacation in a cabin in the woods, and they fall victim to a flesh-eating virus not fast enough. Now, do you feel like this is more gory than scary? Is there a breakdown? Where does that line fall for you? When I rewatch this, I've seen it a couple of times, it goes into the gory territory for me, less the scary, because everyone is terrible, including the locals. Maybe they're marginally less terrible than the college students, but they are disgusting. I think it has new significance now with the whole contagion thing. It does have good sound design. I like the callbacks to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I do like some of those super gory details like fingering her leg hole. But it's grim and grubby and angry, and I'm not always here for it. Well, I feel about Eli Roth similarly to how I feel about Tarantino. At what point does homage tip over into pastiche? And then it's also similar to how I feel about Rob Zombie in that we clearly both love a lot of the same films, but maybe for different reasons. I'm with you on that. I do like that in all of these choices, this is way more of a nature strikes back angle. Yeah, I would definitely enjoy sitting around talking horror with Eli Roth, probably more than watching his body of work. Though the body horror stuff in Cabin Fever is extremely effective. I still remember that shudder that I got seeing her skin sloughing off for the first time. So does that cover it? Is there anything that we left out here? A whole lot of stuff, sir, because I ended up watching more films for this episode. And we left a couple of my favorites off the list. One of those being What Lies Beneath. I think I watched it five times. Spookies, which is incredibly <laughs> terrible. It is two films stuck together. And then possibly my favorite, Witchery from 1988 with Linda Blair and David Hasselhoff. Germans love David Hasselhoff. I have to do my impression of the actress, Leslie Cummings. Are you ready? Okay. Gory, I hope you know how much I appreciate you coming here. Spot on. Thank you. Everybody go watch Witchery, please. Now, out of the things that we did see, did you have favorite themes that developed? Were there standouts? What was the scariest? What was the most New England choice on the list? I think the most New England, shockingly enough, was the City of the Dead. It seemed to capture the location the best. I love the Dunwich Horror, like I mentioned. Seeing some of these things for the first time, like the Stepford Wives, was really fun. But ultimately, I didn't have anything that really, really, really got me in the scary territory that I hadn't already seen, like the Dead Zone that you mentioned. Well, I love seeing Cecil Kellaway pop up a couple of times. He's always such a great presence. And then there were some definite favorites, like you say. Salem's Lot and the Dead Zone, always at the top of the list. The City of the Dead looks the absolute best of everything we have here. The Other is probably the most unique entry here that gives me the most eerie feeling I can't quite put a finger on. And then the children might be my sleeper favorite of the whole bunch. The Devonsville Terror, it might be the least New England since it was shot in Wisconsin. But then the witch, you could say the same thing. It's the most New England it feels like based on realistic period detail, but it was shot in Canada, so who's to say? Ultimately, the big question, did you have fun this time? Heck yeah, I did. Well, that brings us to the end of episode 170. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, 
We would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. Throughout October, I put up a collection of ghost story readings as well, so those are fun. You can check those out. We've also added a simple donation button to the website, so if Patreon's not your thing and you'd rather just make a one-time PayPal donation to help keep the lantern lit, you can go to magiclanternpodcast.com and just look for the donate button in the upper right corner under the header. And that's in the main drop-down menu if you're on a mobile device. And we appreciate everyone's support so much. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter at Lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time, especially Matt Anderson and Rohan King. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. I want to take a second to say a special thanks to our friend Spencer Seams for having me on his show, Shoot the Piano Player. I did a couple of episodes with him recently that will be up in November, and those cover Purple Noon and Black Sunday, so keep an eye out for those. You can find our show on Audible, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify. Just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you would like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 